On this week in Enterprise Tech, it's 80211 AC, the next wave. Twilight on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 135, recorded April 10th, 2015. The next wave of 802.11 AC. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 50-plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidate fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise, and I'm joined by my regular cavalcade of characters, Starting, of course, with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, you're back in paradise. Yes, I am. And I'm losing my mind trying to get all the equipment ordered and ready and delivered. Maui, get ready to put your tinfoil hats on because I'm going to be putting out power sensors all over Maui next week. Yeah, there's nothing that could possibly go wrong with Chibert knowing exactly what's going on all over that island. I'm sure it's... It's, it's a big day to paradise. Uh, speaking of big day to paradise, as we've got the man on the other side of the country, Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, welcome back to the show. It's so good to have you. Thanks, Padre. It's good to be here. Good to be back uh, in the swamp rather than in our uh, warehouse in an undisclosed location in Silicon Valley. Uh, I get to stay here for, uh, gee, one whole additional week before I'm back on the road again. So uh, <laughs> I'm enjoying it while I can. That's that's like a mini vacation. Well, gentlemen, we've got a, a, an interesting episode today. We're going to be talking all about 802.11 AC, the second wave of devices. We've got Matthew Gass coming back in. But before we get to him, let's go ahead and kick it off with the blips. This first one is all about a uh, New York law enforcement agency using a stingray 46 times without a warrant. Now, we already know that law enforcement uses stingrays, those cell phone interception devices that can break connections, capture innocent traffic, and otherwise cause havoc. We already know that law enforcement uses stingrays without a warrant, opting instead to get a court order, which carries a much lower burden of proof. What we're just starting to learn is exactly how Kafka-esque is the security policy that surrounds the use of those stingrays. And the Erie County Police Department in New York is giving us an unprecedented look at exactly that. It has come to light that this single department has used stingrays 47 times since 2010, and only once did they obtain even the lower burden of proof court order to do so. But that's not the story. The story is that there is an amazingly set, uh, convoluted set of rules that law enforcement operates under. Essentially, the FBI maintains the right to force the dismissal of cases if said cases might result in the release of information on how stingrays work, which, according to them, could jeopardize national security. It's not clear how the FBI believes that they can prevent the public from learning about stingrays, since the cost, model numbers, and tech specs of the devices can now be found on the Internet, but it does make for interesting reading if you're looking to learn how to continue violating the Fourth Amendment without oversight. You know that HP public cloud story we had a couple of weeks ago? Well, never mind, or not. HP is splitting itself into two separate pieces, one for the enterprise and one for the desktop and personal productivity stuff. And depending on who you're talking to, Helion, HP's public cloud offering, is either dead as a doornail or a critical part of the company's future. In a comment to Computer World, HP said that they're absolutely continuing the public cloud offering, but in a way that doesn't compete with any other public cloud offerings. How are they going to pull off that balancing act? Stay tuned. I have a feeling there are a fair number of people at HP who are eager to learn the answer to that particular question as well. Amazon is cracking down on a website that has been selling five-star reviews. 
Amazon is filing suit against a man that's been setting up websites in order to sell five-star Amazon reviews in a move to punctuate that is not only against their rules, but also against the law. So while their websites are saying that they're not just sourcing the reviews from around the world, the reality, according to Amazon, is these sites are shipping empty boxes or similar simply to game the Amazon review system. Seems one of those sites, Gentile, is using barely disguised logos that are, according to Amazon, also trademark infringements. Hmm. Maybe those reviews might someday mean something, but not at the moment. Uh, the big wigs in security are starting to get what the Twilight Riot has known for, well, over 18 months. Perimeter security is dead. Earlier this year, Richard Clark, formerly the cybersecurity czar of the United States, busted the illusion of security from big firewalls and traditional security by announcing to a group of enterprise elite that, quote, the bad guys are already in your network, unquote. Promoting what he called whole company analysis, Clark said that it's time for companies to decide what their data crown jewels are and to plan for worst-case scenarios of, ha of having hackers inside the walls. Components of that worst-case planning include network segmentation, interior firewalls, a dedicated chief information security officer, and data that can stay protected even if the entire network is compromised. In other words, trust no one. Microsoft and Dropbox are getting cozy -er. Microsoft's web-based and non-Windows tablet versions of Office have been useful, but to this point have tried to tie you fairly tightly to Microsoft's OneDrive cloud storage offering. That's been a problem for many people, but it's becoming a smaller problem now that Microsoft has announced tighter integration between Microsoft Office Online and Dropbox. I noticed that the iOS version of Office apps have allowed for Dropbox storage for a couple of months. The latest version of the app set available on today, though, allows for not only storage in Dropbox, but collaboration through Dropbox. You can share and collaborate there. This is a major step forward for the Windows Online suite. More is sure to come. <coughs> Keep watching the agile pace developments for the latest in Office integration. Wah, wah, wah. Padre SJ is a sad panda because the Indian police are using pepper spray on drones for crowd, crowd control of unruly mobs. In a category of it was bound to happen someday, the Indian police are reported by Wired UK to be outfitting drones with pepper spray systems as a non-lethal but effective way to control unruly mobs. Man, oh man, am I having flashbacks to the Harrison Ford Blade Runner movies and other science fiction horror stories of how law enforcement has gone wild. Well, it's certainly better than lethal force, and it puts less law enforcement personnel into harm's way, but... Hey, are you a Verizon customer? Well, you can rejoice because you can finally opt out of super cookies. No, seriously, we mean it this time. Since the end of 2014, we've known that Verizon has been tagging a unique identifier to each mobile user's traffic for use in their relevant mobile advertising program. The identifier, named a super cookie by critics of the program, was enabled by default and customers had to opt out of the tracking program with a call to Verizon. Even after opting out, however, customers could still be tracked because the super cookies would report your web browsing activity to third parties. Well, now, out of the kindness of their hearts and because they've been taking it in the teeth for yet another miscalculation as to the degree with which their customers enjoy their privacy, Verizon is giving us yet another number to call to opt out of the tracking program after you've already opted out of the tracking program. Just call 1-866-211-0874 or better yet, call the cancellation line. Tell them that they've materially changed the terms of your agreement and that they need to let you out of your contract fee free. Well, folks, that's the end of the blips. Let's go ahead and jump straight into the bites. The first one is all about Microsoft's virtualization rush. Now, Microsoft has been making a full court press on virtualization on several fronts. Now, just this last week, they've, there's been a couple of interesting announcements that we've been able to tease out of the news. The first one comes to us from our very own Mary Jo Foley of Windows Weekly, who talked about how Microsoft has upped their server virtualization game. Specifically, they announced their nano server deployment mode this week. It will be introduced at some point after the Windows Server 2016 preview, so it's not going to be available in the one that's coming out this month. But it will allow admins to strip down Windows Server to a very small footprint. It's 1 20th the size of Windows Server Core. It consists only of essential components like Hyper-V, clustering, networking, storage.net, core CLR, and it has no GUI. 
Now, it seems as if their strategy is to encourage the containerization of Windows Server with this new format and give you the ability to dynamically spin up and down nano servers for particular services. Uh, uh, Chibert, you've been messing around with Hyper-V a lot, and Windows is basing this new virtualization push off of Hyper-V. What do you see here? Uh, what's with the nano servers? Why this, this new push from, instead of having a lot of super capable boxes, having even more micro capable boxes well this all goes in line with things like what people are doing with chef um and also goes in with the uh, microsoft push for containers which is similar to what chef is doing the whole idea is right now in the hyper v world you don't have access to this huge variety of uh virtual appliances that the vmware people have um, because most of these virtual appliances are based on Linux and you don't have to worry about licenses. Well, with a non-GUI version of Windows Server and having a much more agreeable way of handling, say, the equivalent of runtime licenses, uh, we should start seeing more containerized virtual appliances so, um, come out. And we'll put them squarely into competition with one of the huge advantages of the VMware world. And uh, the other thing about this is pricing. <laughs> Curtis, along with the announcement of these new nano containerized versions of Windows Server, Microsoft has been making moves to simplify pricing. Now, this is an ongoing thing. This actually started with the, uh, the, uh, the new CEO. Do you see that as being big? I mean, it's not just that they're offering more products that are, are better for virtualization, but they're making it easier for IT departments to decide which versions they need. Is, is that, is that a, a natural part of the strategy? Oh, it's a huge part of the strategy because managing Microsoft licenses is an enormous component at many enterprises of the total cost of ownership for those Microsoft products. I know of enterprises that have entire departments, not just a person, but a department dedicated to figuring out, optimizing, analyzing, and managing their Microsoft software licenses. Um, and Cries to simplify Microsoft licensing have been heard for years, if not decades, among the large customers for Microsoft's products. I think that going in and figuring out how to make it simpler to buy and most important from Microsoft's perspective, make it cheaper to buy in large quantities is something that they see as critical for building larger and larger user bases for their virtual servers. Well, gentlemen, uh, let's go ahead and add a wrinkle to this, uh, specifically the wrinkle of Docker. Now, Docker has been hot the last couple of months. It's, it's a fantastic container technology that, that allows you to take your applications, wrap them into a layer of abstraction, and essentially run them on any hardware. In fact, Synology, IOSafe, these, uh, these NAS boxes that are used for SMB, Many of them are adding support for Docker, which is nice because it means that you can start on a local device, you can add more local devices as you need more power, then you can move it into the cloud and into large infrastructures if you need the power. Now, Chibert, along with this announcement last week, Microsoft has also said that they're, they're pushing the Docker strategy of containers, but they're making it manageable via Hyper-V. Hyper How does that work exactly? Well, it's all part of their big move. As in the transition between Server 2008 and Server 2012, they have dropped all their WMI interfaces, which had a lot of ties into the hardware, and went completely PowerShell. So now from the command line, you can do anything. It's mm. absolutely 100%. And what that gives you is the ability to go and manage and get access to every last single tidbit of information in the system right down to hardware level if it's so implemented. So having this Docker capability really and truly makes the virtual appliances truly scalable. And as part of Microsoft System Center, you can actually create entire clusters or entire arrays of machines. So instead of saying, I need this server, this server, and this server, now you can say, I need the corporate standard CRM or corporate standard ERP. Please deploy it from my pool of resources. So it's basically making the cloud, private cloud, public cloud um, barriers go away and make it significantly easier to deploy large systems without having quite so much IT involvement.
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you on this, Chibert, because uh, you are our expert in virtualization. What are the advantages that you get of using a hybrid, hybrid Hyper-V slash Docker solution? Why wouldn't you just go with Docker? Docker seems to be hot. What does Microsoft bring to the game that you can't get with just a standard Docker container? Actually, I don't think there's a whole lot of technological difference between Docker and Hyper-V. It's Look at Docker as a more private cloud. Mm, okay. um, being able to move things around. Because keep in mind, Microsoft wants the server market. It is the cash cow for them. And an awful lot of the enterprise world is on Microsoft's servers. So with Docker, it allows us to move back and forth between prototyping on your Windows 8 or now Windows 10 workstations, get it running how you want, move it into a small test environment, and then throw it up into the large enterprise and then eventually all the way up into the Azure cloud. So what Microsoft is doing is they're filling in the gaps on the roadmap so that your virtual machines and your services can move back and forth from the personal workstation all the way up into the public cloud. Nice. Well, gentlemen, let's go ahead and move on to the second enterprise bite because, well, I've been just kind of itching to do this one. Now, one of the smallest states in the union may be showing the rest of the country how you do municipal broadband. Now, Connecticut is the third smallest state in the union. It's not known for tech aside from a very valiant effort it made in trying to combat some patent trolls. However, it looks like it now may become the model for how you do municipal broadband in a new net neutral country. Now, the website Efficient Government details exactly what they've tried to do, the strides that they've made in the state with the motto of he who is transplanted still sustains. I never quite understood that one, but it makes sense. They have made movements towards an ubiquitous one, gigab one gigabit fiber network across 46 of their municipalities. Now, those 46 municipalities account for about 50% of the state's population, and they formed a consortium to bring high speed to businesses, universities and residents okay now so far that's just buzzwords we've heard that before right that's that's a politician trying to get votes and trying to get the people behind him we've seen some of these programs fail in fact we've seen some of these programs fail spectacularly where they build up so much public debt that the network will never be cost effective there are a few things that connecticut is doing that i think are actually exemplary their plan, in a nutshell, is number one, to not use any funds from the state or from any of the participating municipalities. Instead, they want to create a public-private partnership that will A, seek financing from fiber network builders and from internet providers, and B, provide assets and resources from each municipality, which in, is in essence cutting red tape. And three, they want to enforce single poll administration. This is a big one. They're going to make it make it so that there's a single administration in the state that that has a uniform right to all polls. In other words, you cannot be that poll owner holdout demanding more and holding up a fiber deployment. Instead, once the state or the municipality has agreed that someone, a company is going to come in and run fiber, everyone has to agree to the common licensing and rental terms. Uh, that That's actually huge. Chibert, I want to throw this over to you first because I think number two and number three, creating the public-private link and enforcing single-poll administration, that's what we've talked about a lot on Twiat as things that hold up more competition. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Finally, you know, duh, this is, you know, I don't know how many states and how many um, ISPs and everybody that's been trying and trying and trying, you know, Google's been saying this. The Number two and number three, create the public-private partnership. And the big one is single poll administration are absolutely key. Without those, nothing grows. Um, the state of Hawaii, Honolulu actually tried uh, municipal broadband and ran up in an amazing debt. It right. just didn't work. Some of the private communities in Honolulu tried that with the so-called fourth conduit in the ground. Um, but unfortunately, someone got a little greedy and made it very difficult to get permits to use that fourth conduit. So I think this is an amazing step in the right direction. And I'm hoping the city planners in Honolulu are watching carefully. Uh, Curtis, I want to throw that, that, that there's three hopes for this plan. One, that they'll avoid building a mountain of, of uh, public debt uh, by encouraging private investment. Two, that they will empower municipalities to grant fiber running 
rights to newer ISPs, in other words, cut all the red tape. And three, they want to make new ISPs a possibility at all. Uh, I, wanna, I want you to focus on that first one, this whole idea of building partnerships to avoid building a, a, a mountain of public debt. There are critics who are already coming out and looking at the Connecticut plan, a Connecticut plan and saying, you're just giving another generation of ISPs the same thing that the previous generation had. In fact, that's, that's how Comcast and Cox and Time Warner started. Cities, municipalities invited them in and essentially gave them a preferred seat for right-of-way, for ownership of poles to deploy a network. Are we just repeating the mistake or do you see something different in this plan that hopefully will lead to a different outcome? Well, I think the key difference has to do with uh, poll management access and administration. Uh, if the, the deals that are struck allow essentially for the municipalities, in other words, for someone other than the ISPs, to control who can have access to the polls, to control how the access fees are managed, then I think they've done something important. Uh, it's, it's fine if they want to allow each ISP to control what happens on its cable. The polls are what matters. And that's where previous generations really had a, an in that was difficult to, to get past. They would build some part of the infrastructure, whether it's uh, underground uh, cable runs or poles or whatever. And because they had that in place with their uh, medium running through it, where it was, whether it was copper or, or fiber, that meant that they made it prohibitively expensive for companies that did not have their monopoly status to come in and go behind them. If this limits the monopoly to the, the physical medium rather than the poles, then I think they've got a, a really good chance at doing something important that won't lock them in for decades to come. Right, right. Uh, Cheaper, we've actually got a, chess, a question from the chat room from Java Man who says, wait, wait a minute, who, who manages poll access right now? Uh, can, can you talk a little because I know you've had experience of it. I know that I've seen it here in San Francisco of what it's like to be a new ISP or an upstart ISP trying to get permission to run polls across the city? Well, most of the time, it's not the municipality. It's, that's the easiest answer. Uh, a lot of times, it's the incumbent. The, the Whoever put the physical polls in and bore the initial cost of putting up those polls is who controls access. Now, normally there is some oversight by the PUC, but the PUC doesn't always override that and they don't certainly most of the time don't have control over the pricing. So yeah, Google has run into this many, many times of trying to get the last mile put in and suddenly run into astronomical poll fees or, oh yeah, sure, we'll give it to you for you know the same price as everybody else, but you're going to have to wait till our people can supervise putting it in. So all these little things add up to people like Google saying, okay, well, maybe this municipality just doesn't want Google Fire and they move on. It's all about politics, all about who controls the money. And unfortunately, in most of the cases I've seen, it's always been whoever put the polls in. My personal opinion is I think Connecticut's doing the right thing. It should be the municipality that owns the polls. Maybe they don't own the physical poll. Maybe they just lease the, the hole in the ground. But for God's sakes, take control of it, take ownership and be, you know, something that can help trade, not hinder it. All right. I actually had a, an off the record conversation with uh, with a person in San Francisco who runs a company that that is trying to develop their own ISP in areas like San Francisco. And he talks about the red tape of death which is, you know, in San Francisco, there actually is a process by which an ISP can force their way onto a poll. That's, that's actually a right. But there are all sorts of checks and balances that the incumbent can use to trigger a stalling maneuver at like a dozen different points along the way. So essentially what happens is, yeah, they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, well, like Cheever said, we'll, we'll give you access, but we want to make sure that one of our people is there. Uh, oh, and by the way, there's an environmental impact survey that we're going to have to do because we don't know if adding another poll is going to change the, the plight of polar bears. I mean, it, it's really that simple that they can delay you to the point where it's no longer cost effective for you to try to use their poll. 
What this does, what this new Connecticut plan will do, is it will put all of that under the jurisdiction of one office. And that one office will say, look, here's a fair price for you to get for rental of your poll. We're going to make sure you get taken care of. Your investment will be paid back. But once the decision is made that such and such an ISP can come into this area of the city, none of you can hold up deployment. I, I just really like that. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the last enterprise by this one. This one's kind of a doozy. I, I see this being a full episode at some point in the near future because we're seeing more and more of this with PayPal, Apple Pay, and so, and so, so forth. And that's that Microsoft is jumping into the mobile payments field. Now, last week, Microsoft detailed their plans to release a tap-to-pay mobile digital payment system that they say will rival Apple Pay. Now, the sleuths at Business Insider found that the Redmond company had already been granted a money transmitter license from the state of Idaho with the other states of operation shortly to follow. Now, the solution, as far as we can figure out, is a tap-to-pay system. It's baked into Windows 10's 10 phones. It will use NFC, and here's a big one. It doesn't use a secure element SIM card, so it becomes carrier independent. Now, Chiebert, I like the fact that they're trying, but is this going to get much traction? Oh, okay. Uh, maybe I'm asking the wrong person. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Give, give it me. Give, hit me. So, I like it. I like the fact that it's not tied to the carrier. I like the fact that it seems to be going to be something kind of open. And just keep in mind, nobody in their right mind is going to do their own uh, credit card transactions internal. They're all going to be using some sort of back end. When I read these, this press release, I'm seeing more of we're creating a back end. So I see someday, this is my prediction, that Visual Studio, the Microsoft development environment, is going to have baked in subroutines and modules for their um, credit card management system because that is what I see when I see that permit from Idaho. I see a back end that could very well be more than just tap and pay. I think tap and pay is how they're going to make it visible to the public, but I think it's going to be the back end processing those credit card and PayPal transactions that is baked into the entire .NET world. And I think they might have something here. Yeah, and honestly, the back end really is where the cash is going to be. I mean, it's nice to have the interface, but if you can create a system that's trusted, that becomes the new compliance standard for financial transactions, yeah, there's that's a huge revenue source. In fact, let's talk a little bit about that. I want to throw this over to you, Curtis, because we know that right now the, the one with the buzz is Apple Pay. Apple has a, a decent solution. It's It had a lot of buzz. It got a lot of signups. Apple Pay has launched, what is it, like seven months ago now? And it seems to be continuing its growth. The services can now tie into the bank cards that account for 90 plus percent of all the transactions that are made by volume. It's found at more and more retailers like Staples, major grocery chains like Albertson. And uh, we even see movements from Google who uh, they've had their wallet since the end of 2011, which also made a big splash, but petered off. Now, all of that's great, but when we actually look at digital transactions, Apple, Google, Microsoft are a drop in the bucket compared to the big player. And the big player is PayPal. That's right. PayPal actually accounted for, what was it, 78% of all digital payments in the end of 2014. That's $46 billion of payments uh, in all of 2014. So when we talk about Microsoft getting into the game, I don't necessarily see them going up against the likes of Google or Apple. I see them, like Chebert, going for that back end, which would put them up against PayPal, which right now rules the roost. What's, what's your thought? Well, I think that at the moment, PayPal is like the, uh, the Western Union of digital money transfers. Uh, it, they are the, the simplest one. Lots of people know about PayPal. And a lot of those people know about PayPal because they became familiar with it through eBay. Uh, it had a huge advantage there. And it's going to maintain that advantage because just the volume of people, I mean, we, we know from, let's call it, everything that has ever happened <laughs> that once someone gets a particular system that they're comfortable with it takes a ton to move them off that system uh, you, you have to offer some some critical advantages to get them off that system 
the back end is going to, to make a difference. I think what we're seeing now is what happened over a period of time with credit cards. You know, most people don't realize that before roughly the, the late 50s, early 60s, credit cards didn't exist. I mean, they, they just weren't a thing. You might have accounts with individual merchants, but the notion of a single card backed by a consortium or a bank that you would take with you and use in multiple places was foreign. Um, and so it took, call it 30 years, for us to develop the entire infrastructure to make credit cards happening. Um, it'll take less time than that, but right now what we have is a situation that is similar to that that would exist if every plastic credit card we had were a different shape and used a magnetic strip in a different place so that you couldn't have a single, you know, uh, Verifone card swiper to use. The, the key to making everything work is going to be that point of sale terminal that accepts all of these. Um, it'll take a while for that to shake out. And in the meantime, I think you're dead right. Microsoft's focus on the back end is important. And I tell you somebody else who we need to keep watching in that space, and that's Square. Uh, mm, Square yeah. has uh, built the back end. They've got the, the transaction engines going, and they have begun competing with PayPal on a here's how to send cash basis. So um, companies like PayPal, uh, and I'll throw in Quicken uh, or Intuit to, to that particular um, pot of competitors. These are the companies that have the transaction engines on the back end and who really know how to deal with making a living off that, you know, two and three quarter percent of every transaction that happens. Of course, we would be remiss if we didn't mention that Verifone was actually invented in Hawaii, right, Chibert? You got it. <laughs> Carl, Ch Carl Chang actually worked for GTE Hawaiian Telephone and asked them, do you want to start doing this business? And they, silly boys, put it in writing saying, no, we're not interested in this business, which then gave him permission to spin off a company and built Verifone, which is a monster. Just about all the credit card validation systems on earth now, or at least a large percentage, are made by Verifone. The sad part is Verifone moved out of Hawaii, so bummer. Yeah. But there you have it, folks. If you're an engineer, maybe your next no will be a multi-billion dollar idea. Go figure. Now, when we come back, we're going to be bringing in Matthew Gast. He is the Quizwatch Haderach of technology over at Aerohive. I've just made that up. I, I think that's actually a pretty cool title. But he's going to be telling us all about 802.11ac, the second wave. But before we go there, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the sponsor for this episode of this week in Enterprise Tech, and it's ZipRecruiter. Now, let me ask you something. Are you hiring? Because if you are, there are a few things that you should keep in the back of your mind. The first thing is that you have to make sure you cast a big net because these days, it's not just about finding the person who has the right skill set. It's also about finding the right person for the culture of your company. And you're only going to get that when you've got enough candidates to choose from. Now, I've done my share of hiring and, and the process was always the same. You post a job listing, you get candidates, you screen the candidates, and then you hire the best candidate and regret it half the time. The problem is that you do need to cast that wide net, which is why we're proud to have ZipRecruiter as part of the Twiat Riot. They understand that posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites, and that's what ZipRecruiter does for you. With ZipRecruiter.com, you post your job once, and it gets placed on 50-plus job sites, including Craigslist, LinkedIn, and Twitter, all with a single click. A ZipRecruiter will help you find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. And now ZipRecruiter offers Traffic Boost, which can get you up to three times as many qualified candidates for your job opening. There will be no juggling of emails or calls to your office. Instead, you'll quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 200,000 businesses. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. For a free four-day trial, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of this week in enterprise tech. We welcome back to the show. Actually, it may have been a year since he was last on. Mr. Matthew Gast, he's the director of technology at Arrowhive. He is 
He's our wireless guru. Matthew, thank you very much for coming back. I can't believe it's in a year. I would hate to think it's actually been that long. You've been a busy man, and it's, it's, uh, you've, you've had a lot going on, I'd say. Well, the problem that I have right now is that uh, when I say I'm going to the airport, nobody ever knows whether it means I'm going to the airport for work or I'm going to the airport for fun. And that's really a matter of the size of the plane. The smaller the plane, the more fun I have. <laughs> uh, that's right. Uh, I, I do notice that you seem to have a, well, let's be honest, you have a radioactive sheen going on in your face. Does that mean that you were in a glider? It does. It also means your makeup department isn't covering up well enough. No, no. Well, it's typically just Jeffrey Needles with a, a powder brush and so yeah it's not good it really isn't but we're not here to talk about makeup we're here to talk about 80211 ac now this tech has been out for a while it's been well received it, it had a much higher adoption rate than you saw with n so obviously people were ready for a new standard especially one that doesn't seem to be adding any significant cost barriers to entry or technological hurdles but now we're seeing the introduction of Wave 2 devices. We've covered this a few times on This Week in Enterprise Tech. First, with Cisco, when they announced their solution that would integrate, of course, with their switches, because that's what Cisco always does. And then with Ruckus, claiming that they are the first to market. Now, I know you work for Aerohive, which is a competing company, so let's get that out of the way. What would you like to say about those two claims, Cisco and Ruckus? Well, uh, so Ruckus was certainly the first to announce, and they have had a long history of doing a lot of very fancy RF work. So um, it was, uh, it certainly shows the, the momentum behind the technology. And um, the thing is, we've got everybody in this industry has friends at every other company. So I'm, I'm certainly happy for Ruckus um, doing that. Um, and um, what can I say? I'm glad not to be a Cisco customer and have to upgrade all my switches. <laughs> now, we did actually want to talk. Uh, that was that was kind of snippy. I'm sorry. I'll back off from that. I just enjoy that kind of conflict. But we did want to have someone come on and, and give us some of the technical details of this Wave 2 of 802.11ac. And so we wanted to bring someone who wrote the book. And when we say someone who wrote the book, we actually mean you, you wrote the book. This is 802.11ac. This is sort of the Bible from O'Reilly. And if you look, I don't know if you can see that there, Matthew Gast. So you obviously have the background to be able to tell us what this is about. Let's talk about first the 802.11ac spec and why we have wave one and wave two. What's, what's the deal with that? Well, and that, that's a really great place to start because if you go ahead and read the 802.11ac spec, which is very easy to do, um, you can go to get 802, which is the IEEE's process for publishing standards once they're six months old, and you fill in a little form, you download the spec, and you can read all 600 pages, including the ones that are really, really boring and that will put you to sleep. So uh, you can do that and you can say, all right, I'm going to go get the spec. I'm going to go read it. I'm going to understand what wave two is because I'm going to search for wave two in the spec. And what you will find is absolutely nothing. It's a marketing term. Well, yeah, um, that broadly speaking, and this since we don't have that much time, um, when you talk about what's in 11AC, um, there are really four things. You get uh, wider channels. So make the channel wider, you get more data. You get better modulation, pack more data into the um, same amount of time. You get more spatial streams, although um, just because the spec goes up to eight doesn't mean we're actually building eight. And you get this newfangled multi-user MIMO technology. Nice. So all of that's in the spec. The, so what you have to do is then translate that spec into products. And any company that makes products winds up doing this by looking at what's available and what the strategy should be and how long it's going to take to uh, put together a product and launch it. So um, just like any other organization, they wind up looking and seeing where the greatest bang for their engineering buck is. And what that means is that with a big complex spec, you get some things coming out at different points in time. Right. Now, it's interesting because when people see Wave 2, uh, I Almost always, they, there's, a, there's a misconception that, oh, they're already upgrading the standard, which is not true. Because as you mentioned, if you, if you actually look at the technical details for 802.11ac, those four things that you mentioned, the wider channels, MIMO, 256QAM modulation, and multi-user MIMO, those, that's the original spec. It's just that the first wave of devices that were released 
didn't take full advantage of the spec. But why didn't they? Well, because it's a, a really complicated spec. So, mm. um, and multi-user MIMO in particular has had uh, more teething problems than I think anybody in the industry has expected. Um, that um, when you look at building with wider channels, um, going from 20 and 40 like we had in 11N to going to 80 as we had in the first wave of 11AC, that was pretty easy to do. Going to 160 megahertz channels, well, the problem there is that you only get one or two channels, depending on where you are in the world, or maybe even zero. So you're talking about finding a spot in the world where there's already not any Wi-Fi being used that lets you use 160 megahertz channels. So in practice, it doesn't have that big a benefit, so why would you struggle to build it? Um, same thing with looking at MIMO spatial streams. 802.11n allowed you to have four, um, but we couldn't do four and deliver access points that worked in the 15 watt power budget from 802.3af. Now, it's possible to build access points that would do that with more power, but the fact is the switches were in place, that's what everybody really wanted to use, and so therefore that's what we stuck with. Mm -hmm. As we're going with the upgrade to higher power PoE, it's possible to, to look at building additional spatial streams in. Right. And with multi-user MIMO, it just turned out to be so complicated that we had to, to figure out how to make that work at uh, a reasonable scale. So we put in what we could put in right at the beginning, knowing that there was stuff in the standard that we could then build later. Uh, let me ask you a, a generalist question here, because uh, again, wave one, wave two, that's marketing speak. Uh, that's just, that's a nice way to say, okay, what generation of the product are we releasing? But when we speak of wave one, in, in, in a very general way, we were talking about 80 megahertz channels. We were talking about three spatial streams. We were talking about 256 QAM modulation. Wave two, supposedly we should be upping it up to 160 megahertz channels, four spatial streams, and adding in multi-user MIMO. But I want to talk about Ruckus, and again, we're not making fun of their hardware, but they decided that they were going to stick with the 80 megahertz channels. They didn't want to bump up to 160 because they believed in their test that would give the better overall user experience for a wider, for, for a larger connected user base. Uh, are we going to see a lot of this? Are we going to start to see uh, manufacturers differentiate themselves in how they take their, their Gen 2 devices? Well, and this goes back to what you said about it being really more of a, a marketing term, is that Wave 2 winds up being almost a grab bag of, here's this list of things that I can do, and it winds up being a menu that you get to pick from. That when um, the first wave of technology came out, every access point looked more or less the same. Um, that now you're starting to see some of these debates um, among those of us building products about how important it is to have each of these features. And with the 80 versus 160 megahertz channels, uh, it's not just about the user experience, it's also, there is a small hardware implication um, without getting too deeply technical. Um, there are two ways of doing 160 megahertz channels. There's one where you have to have the, the entire 160 megahertz free and contiguous. And then there's a mode where you get to take two 80 megahertz channels and you use them at the same time almost as if they're bonded, but they don't need to be right next to each other. So that does get you more in the way of channels, but um, the ability to say, I have this block of spectrum, it's all free, I can transmit over it, still remains a problem. We don't have a ton of available spectrum, and that in places where Wi-Fi is popular, the spectrum is busy. So the extent to which 160 megahertz channels actually work in the real world is an open question. And um, my, my take on it is that as much as we want them to work, because let's face it, uh, 80 to 160 gives you twice as much speed. It's great. We'd all love it. But the number of places where you have free 160 megahertz channels that don't have interference from legacy devices that will cause you to, to fall back to narrower channel widths. There just aren't that many places in the world where that's going to be the case. Uh, that's that's an, actually an excellent point. And, and that's something that I've been I've been mulling over in my head about 802.11ac because there does seem to be so much space for manufacturers to distinguish their product. I, mean, I could see someone saying, 
you know what? We don't we don't want to go for the full uh, 80 to 11 AC spec because it's not practical. You're never going to find a place where you're going to get full speed off of all eight channels, off of 160 megahertz of bandwidth, off of each one, um, off of full MIMO, and still have a device that is practical, that is affordable, and that works in the real world. Uh, so let me ask, maybe I'm, I'm, I can't ask you this, I don't know, I might be spilling some secret sauce. Where's Arrowhive gonna go? Well, and so if you look at, at the general breakdown of how products work in the industry in general, um, that we all build flagship access points that use all of the capabilities in the specification. And it's, it's the high-end product. It's, you, you buy it, it performs the absolute best, and it, it goes at a premium. But if I were to look at uh, where I expect most Aerohive customers to be, um, this is um, our, our latest access point, and it's nice and hand-sized. Um, so uh, what matters with this is that it's a, it has a great price-performance ratio. It's not your Ferrari access point. It's a Toyota. Mm -hmm. And it has great price performance. It has the features that people want. And that winds up being our best-selling product the number of people who buy the flagship product for any of us is just not that big. It doesn't wind up being the, the, the leader of our business, but it's where we develop new technologies, it's where we bring them to market, and it's where we experiment with them. It's the and trophy it's, truck. It's just it's showing off the technology. Yeah, we can do that, but you're probably not going to want to buy it. Well, it, it's, it's not just that. It, it, it's also that um, it's where we learn how these things work. So um, we know how multi-user MIMO works and how it takes advantage of beamforming. Um, but we know how it works in the lab right now. We don't know how it works in real deployments. And the way that we figure that out is that there are customers who have a burning need to use that. And so they're willing to invest in that flagship product from Aerohive or one of our competitors. And that is where we learn how these new technologies work and how we can then take that into the mass market. Uh, we've actually got a question from the chat room from you, uh, for you from Arizona Listener who specifically wants to know about, about Wave 2 and beef, beam forming. Is this, obviously it's a tech that's out there. It's, it's, it's kind of a nice buzzword to have in your product when your PR people start putting it together. But is it something that you think is going to become more important than other parts of, of the spec? Well, and beamforming is important because it underlies multi-user MIMO. You can't get one without the other. That beamforming at a really high level is the ability to direct energy from an access point. So you say, I know that I have a client over in this direction, so I'm going to focus my transmission energy towards that client. And that improves the signal-to-noise ratio. Improving the signal-to-noise ratio then also improves the, the data rate that you can get. Now, there is a little bit of an implication in how much of a gain you get from beamforming. And you can look in the spec and you can say, these are the, this is what the standard says the required signal-to-noise ratio is to support each of these speeds. So you increase the signal-to-noise ratio, you increase the speed. Now, when you're really close to the access point, you wind up not getting any gain from beamforming because you're already close. You're already getting the maximum you can. When you're really far away, um, you also don't get a gain because you need to increase the signal-to-noise ratio so much just to get a little boost. So it's really in that, that middle range where beamforming is important. Um, so that's beamforming in general. Now, um, just like you wind up getting what are cleverly called retronyms, where you wind up having to uh, define something that was previously defined, um, so that when IBM introduced the Selectric typewriter, um, we, now, we had electric typewriters, so therefore we had to go back and existing typewriters became manual typewriters. Um, when we started to do multi-user MIMO, then the form of MIMO with beamforming, it was single-user beamforming to distinguish it from this new multi-user form. And so single-user beamforming has been around as a concept since 11N. Um, what really helped it take off was that it was simplified in 11AC so that there was only one way of doing it as opposed to a whole set of choices that made it too difficult to do in practice in 11N. Um, but then with multi-user MIMO, we wind up using the beamforming capability because you have to do that. If you're going to transmit simultaneously to two clients, 
um, what you have to do is you have to beamform to one while you simultaneously beamform to the other. And you have to, to choose carefully enough so that the transmission to one doesn't interfere with the transmission to the other. And that's part of what makes it devilishly complex to implement in the real world, is it's not just about trying to, to pick beamforming that goes from your access point to a device, it's that you have to go from the access point to one device, but not any of the others. So rather than being as it was in single user beamforming where you've got two, a two body problem where you have an access point and a receiver, um, now you have to worry about the relationship not just between the access point and each of the receivers, but the relationship of the receivers to each other. All right, all right. Uh, I, I do want to step a little bit out because Chibert reminded me of something that we covered last week, and that was that the FCC had announced that they're going to open up golden frequencies for the Citizens Broadband Radio Service. It's going to be an unregulated, air, well, semi-unregulated area of, uh, of frequencies between 3550 and 3700. Do you, does Arrowhive, I'm not sure if you could tell me this, does Arrowhive or do you know of any other companies that have a uh, well an intent to very quickly start using those frequencies in in their wireless solutions well one of the great things about having been able to go to the Aerohive ipo last year was being on the floor of the new york stock exchange watching our stock trade for the first time <laughs> uh, the downside is that i'm much more limited in what uh, i can tell yeah, you now i, 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 I don't guess. want to get in trouble i don't want to so yeah, um, pretend like i didn't ask the question no you can ask the question i'm just not going to answer from Aerohive's <laughs> perspective um this is uh, an example. It's an example of something the FCC is doing that, in the wireless industry, very broadly constituted, we all love. Mm -hmm. Which is that traditionally, you look at the way the FCC has managed radio spectrum. They've done so in a way that was very top down. We're going to reserve this free frequency space for this use and this frequency space for this use, and you wind up with a, a big map of how it all works. What they're coming to realize from the experience with Wi-Fi is how much can happen when you let people innovate. And if you look at some of the rulemaking that they did around um, the big spectrum release a couple of years ago, they specifically cited what we'd been able to do as unlicensed technology, where we were able to uh, take spectrum that had widely been viewed as, well, quite frankly, junk, because there was so much in it, and we were able to not just use it, but use it and create a whole industry on top of that. So you're starting to see much more of that thinking at the FCC, and it's good for anybody who does anything wireless, not just Wi-Fi, but anything that might possibly run in that spectrum. And so it's a great move, and um, at Aerohive, we love moves like that just because spectrum is such an important part of any business built on radio. Very well said, and I doubt any of that will get you in trouble with the FCC. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring I want to bring my co-hosts in here because they've been chomping at the bit. Uh, let's start with you first, Curtis, because again, you you always give us our sort of executive level view of the topics that we're discussing on the show. Is 802.11, especially the second wave of 802.11 AC devices, a topic of conversation that you're hearing in more and more boardrooms that you're hearing asked from CTOs and CIOs? Depends a little bit on where we're talking about, but but yes, I am hearing more about it. Um, I'll tell you one particular area of application is the educational market. Uh, I had a conversation not long ago with uh, the IT director for Houston Community College. Now, you, you think this is a small thing, but they have 26 campuses across the Houston area, and they are retrofitting all of them with uh, 11AC, and they are planning to go out with Wave 2. Now, now they are not Aerohive customers, I'll be honest. Uh, they are Cisco customers. And I was fascinated by one of the things that I, that I hadn't really considered. And that was that in order to take advantage of 11AC Wave 2, they're having to provision each access point drop, not only with some targeted uh, PoE, but with dual... 10 gig drops. Um, and when you start thinking about just how many drops that is over a campus, that's a non-trivial investment on the back end. You know, let, let's forget about what it costs for the access points. We're suddenly looking at, at a huge investment in their, their core stack. The reason that they're doing this, though, is um, a number that I've heard repeated from several people, so I, I think it has some credence, and that is that 
in the average university campus, and by extension, I think, in the average corporate office, each person now brings with them seven devices that will do their darndest to get on the Wi-Fi network. So instead of one, you know, a Wi-Fi device for every individual, now we're talking about look at your human population, multiply that number by seven, and you have an idea of the device density. That right there is why 11AC Wave 1 and Wave 2 are so important and are being discussed by so many people. All right. Uh, Chibert, I have to bring you in here because, well, you spent basically the last two weeks playing with a bunch of Wave 2 devices at the Interop Hot Stage. What are we going to see in, is it two weeks when we get to the show? Well, it's obviously going to be more available bandwidth if and only if you have an updated AC um, radio in your device. You know, not everybody can handle it yet. There are still some older technologies. I still run into a whole bunch of technology where it's still in 2.4 gigahertz, for God's sakes. So some of the people with the newer devices are going to see, in hopefully, a dramatic um, sp speed boost. But my question for Matthew is actually, I'm, I'm actually starting to see two parties, two, two, two countries with the wireless vendors. I see one that are going for speed, coverage, and so forth, thing with the bread and butter of the wireless industry. But I'm also starting to see a lot more people integrating in um, customer-facing pieces like the Walmarts or the Targets where they want to know where the people are hovering. You know, uh, how long do they stay outside the, with the storefront window before they walk in? Um, so is Matthew starting to see this? Are your customers starting to demand this type of uh, functionality in your wireless system? That's a great question. And part of what, the way that I think of it is that the world is becoming much more integrated. And I actually think of this as almost a new frontier in networking. That traditionally in the Wi-Fi space, what we've done is we've made it faster every couple of years or more than every couple of years, if I want to be honest about it. And that that speed was a great thing in and of itself. That you went from 11B, which was DSL speed basically, and you went to 11N, which was the first time we had ether, rough ethernet equivalents. Um, gigabit to the desktop never took off, so what is it about 11AC that's, that makes that, that speed useful? And it is about the capacity that Curtis mentioned, um, but networking is not just about moving bits anymore. It's also about what you know about them. And so it becomes much more about who is using the network, what are they allowed to do, and so granting access appropriately, making sure that people are authorized appropriately for different applications, um, those are much bigger problems. And as the network becomes much more important, it's not enough to just say, oh, well, it works as well as it does, and that's what I'm going to put up with. You need to be able to to, to troubleshoot networks in a reasonable way. And you have to be able to look back and find out more about what a, why a session went wrong, maybe after the fact. Because nobody takes the time out of their day to say, oh, the wireless isn't working right now, I'm gonna go call IT. They may wait for their meeting to end and they'll struggle along. And then afterwards, they'll go ask IT what's going on when the problem may not be occurring anymore. So the ability to dive deeply into what's, what's happening um, is, something that is now totally new to networking and you provide a lot of additional information about the user's whole experience. It's not just about delivering a certain bit rate, it's about making sure that they get access to what they need, that they are tied into the resources they need and it means that all of us in the Wi-Fi business are growing up, that we're no longer just access point companies, that we're becoming networking companies. And Matthew, we've actually got a flurry of chat room questions that I want to get in here before we have to close out the episode. We've got Web2254, who is actually like other people in our audience, asking about the, the, the need now to have multiple runs to access points running Wave 2 because they're going to go beyond the, the limits of a single run. And even to arrays, 802.11ac arrays that are going to need multiple 10 gig uh, runs. Uh, what what do you see as the future of infrastructure? And this is where I think Cisco is really going to push their advantage of saying, well, 
you're going to need a switch solution for this because you know, the standard networking just won't be able to feed your APs what you want. And that, that's certainly been a long, long discussion going on. Uh, the important thing, um, just to start with, is to use the best cable you can so you get the maximum future proof in what goes into the wall gets embedded into the wall. Now, let's look beyond that. So the first thing to remember is that we talk about speed differently in Wi-Fi than e the Ethernet world talks about speed that when Ethernet tells you this is a one gigabit link, they actually have protocol overhead for interframe spacing and acknowledgements and whatever it is they do. Um, so that when they say a gigabit, they really mean a gigabit. In the Wi-Fi world, when we say a gigabit, we mean that there's the payload of the packet that's a gigabit, but you got headers, trailers, you've got interframe spacing, there's required acknowledgements. So the rate that you achieve is never what you see on the box of a Wi-Fi device. And that's, it's, tradition in the way that we talk about speed versus the way that Ethernet talks about speed. And there's really nothing to be done about it at this point. So if you were to look at the standard wave one speed of 1.3 gigabits, well, that's 1.3 gigabits in the payload, but not um, overall throughput. So you look at, say, the, the, the announced AP um, in wave two, it's still 80 megahertz channels. So you add the four spatial stream, you go an extra 30% because you go from three streams to four streams. You go from 1.3 to 1.7. Now, even then, the speed depends on the distance you have from the access point. So that's the maximum speed provided that you are sitting close enough to the access point to get that speed. And if you look at the required signal to noise ratio to be at that speed, you, you have to be very close to the access point. There's a, there's, there is a spatial distribution of how far away from the access point you are. So you don't have to worry about every client hammering you at the absolute top speed all of the time. Um, so in practice, um, a really rough number that you can use is to knock off 30, 40, 50% from that headline rate to get the actual throughput. And this brings us to the next point where we talk about speed differently from ethernet. When an ethernet link is described as a gigabit, it's a gigabit in both directions. Because the radio medium in Wi-Fi is half duplex, you can either transmit or receive, um, therefore, you get an additional advantage plugging into an Ethernet switch because it can go in both directions at the same time, and we in Wi-Fi can't. So you, look, you start to look at what reasonable assumptions look like, and for that base case of I don't think I can use 160 megahertz channels because sadly I live in a place with lots of other people who are using Wi-Fi, so I can't go beyond 80 megahertz channels. That even if I've got that four spatial stream, that <clears throat> there really isn't, um, there, there aren't plausible cases of getting beyond a sustained gigabit in both directions. Um, now, that said, my recommendation always is to put in a second cable if you're doing a cabling project because the cost of the cable is a very small part of the project. Most of it is the labor for people to pull the cable in. And so you want to take advantage of that when you've already got the project going to put two cables in. Um, that may let you um, do, uh, fa do channeling. Um, so you put two cables together, might let you put two sources of power together for uh, future access points that haven't been invented yet. Um, but under any reasonable set of assumptions, you don't need to have two cables to support the initial wave two. Now, will you need them for wave three? And so a lot, a lot of it depends on what you feel like your horizon for the physical plant is. And because that tends to be longer, I generally recommend that people put in two cables, but not because I think it's going to be absolutely necessary. Well, there you have it. More power. <laughs> That's the only summation I could come up with that. Uh, Matthew Guest, we want to thank you so very much for being on the show. I actually did check. It's been since uh, May 14th of 2014 since you were last on Twice. So it's almost a year, just shy of 11 months. We will have to make sure that uh, you come on more, much more often than that. It's always a pleasure to have you on, and uh, I, we do appreciate your expertise. I am always glad to be here, and I will make sure it's not a year before I'm back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. You have spent over an hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to 9 out of 10 802.11ac devices. Uh, we do want to thank all our panelists for making this show possible. Let's, let's start with Matthew. Matthew, 
I'm just blown away. Seriously, that that has been the most fun I've had in an episode in a while. Could you please tell the folks where they can find you, where they can find Arrow High, where they can find an, more about your book? Uh, because you deserve as much promotion as you can get right now. <laughs> well, and thank you for that. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Matthew S. Gast, as is down here, there down here on the screen. Um, I am blogging at blogs.arrowhive.com, and I'm currently working on an 11AC Wave 2 series. First post went live on Monday, and I am working on the others to run in the next few weeks. And you can typically find me at events that are listed on our event page. So I'm often somewhere around the world. Um, please don't talk to me on an airplane, though. I probably need to sleep. You probably need to also. You probably need to put on sunscreen the next time you get into a a, a glider because, yeah, you got you got a little bit of uh, microwave radiation going on with the whole thing. Believe it or not, I actually wear SPF 50. The trouble Ooh. is, I'm Irish, so ah, if I think okay. about the sun, I start to turn <laughs> pink. If I actually see the sun, then it, go, it happens much faster. <laughs> well, a man who does not have a problem with burning, Chebert, where are you going? What you doing? Where are you going to be at? I'll I'm going to be on Maui next week doing the power monitoring deployments. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to be playing with lots of radios, but in this case, they're going to be 3G radios. And a uh, big shout out to uh, one of our fans who's actually going to be helping me build a private APN just for the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. You can listen to my rants and raves at Twitter at ADV NetLab. Oops, closer to this side. And uh, I hopefully will have a few articles at InfoWorld um, someday soon. And if you're at Interop, please feel free to find me in the fishbowl at the Net Network Operations Center for the Interop Net show. Yes, and Chevert will probably be uh, loaded up with samples of Lee Hing powder, which is like crack for foodies. So uh, if you find them, demand some. Uh, on the other coast, and uh, as just as equally a part of This Week in Enterprise Tech as anybody else, Mr. Curtis Franklin, what will you be doing for Information Week Radio? I know as, as we get into the interop season, you do kind of get busier. What, what do you have cooking? Well, every Tuesday, we've got interop radio uh, that's found on Blog Talk Radio, and you can find the specific URLs by uh, following me at my Twitter handle down here at KG4GWA. Uh, every Friday, we're doing Information Week Radio. We've got Dark Radio this week on Wednesday at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, look over at darkreading.com for, for their URL. Uh, and we're getting ready for a really heavy, heavy schedule during Interop. Lots of radio. I'm going to be taking lots of photographs, a bunch of video. I'm just doing the whole media sweep thing but uh in the meantime i've got one more week to do my taxes uh, <laughs> enjoy some home cooked food and just uh, try to sleep as much as possible gentlemen it was always a pleasure and it's always a pleasure to have you the person who comes back each and every single week and watches live or downloads our episode don't forget that you can get our episodes automatically into your device of choice by going to our show page which is at twit.tv slash twiet there you'll find our entire back catalog of episodes, all 135 now, and uh, find our notes if there's a story that you want to read up on, or if there's a guest who you, you just really want more of their knowledge, you can find it all right there next to some drop-down menus where you can get an audio version, a video version, a high-definition video version into your Mac, your PC, your laptop, your desktop, your phone, your tablet, no matter how you want it, we'll give it to you because we love you. Speaking of the way that we love you, we do the show live every Friday at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Drop by at live.twit.tv so you can see the pre-show, the post-show, and everything that goes in between. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into the chat room? I've got you guys right up there. So if you want to ask questions during the show, if, you, if you've got, well, questions for the host or the guest, or if there's something that you'd really like us to ask, it's a, it's a good way to interact and be part of the experiment that is Twit TV. I also want to thank everyone here who makes this show possible. Of course, that's Lisa, that's Leo, who let us do this show, to Carson, my super producer, and of course, to my TD. That's right, he is the Eskimo Zach. Zach, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, and um, you can see me posting photos of writing segues, by the way, I think for the writing lesson, Padre. <laughs> 
And also, thank you for the pork bun the other day. That yes. was quite tasty. Yes, I keep I keep our uh, our our uh, uh, engineers and TDs here flush with steam buns. Very strange. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser. Just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Yeah.